Go, go first, first Spites. Don't worry. worry. I'm, I'm fine. fine. Go. go. I'm, I'm worried. worried. Okay, okay so admit. I'm admitting people, people one, one by one. one. Hello, everybody. everybody. One, one by one. one. Wow. And then we, we can, we can go, go on streaming, streaming now. now. We are on streaming now. Thank you. A bunch of people come in. Come in. Okay. Hi. Good morning. Okay. okay. Alessandra. Alessandra. Yes. yes. Uh, is everybody, is everybody in? Do you like everybody in? Sandra? Can yeah. you start? I, I've allowed everybody. everybody. Right. right. So, so uh, you are actually, actually welcome to the stage for your introduction, Alessandra. Right. right. Okay. okay. So, so thank, thank you very much, much everybody, for joining us. We, we have, have, I can see, over 50 people joining us today. Start. Sorry, Alessandra, you should, should show your PowerPoint at the moment. I don't see your PowerPoint. No, not yet, because I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see people if I show my PowerPoint. Oh, that's right. I can go full screen. Okay, okay. Um, I'm mute. I'm mute. Good. Good. <laughs> that's fine. Um, <laughs> So thank, so thank you very, very much, much everybody for joining us. us. Uh, this is the first uh, uh, presentation that we have uh, in this uh, uh, series. It's a, it's a new series, series of course. We, we joined the new times, times uh, due to, due to, to the, the coronavirus and thought about uh, having this series of 10 lectures initially. These lectures are by the people that right now belong to our teaching committee. And actually, we are starting with the new members of our teaching committee, of which Ron Bokshma is the one, and we thank Ron really sincerely for doing this and to be the first one to actually be the inaugural lecture of our series ever at the GCSI. Um, so, okay, I think everybody is in, so right now, what I'm so, so what I'm doing right now is actually starting a brief presentation in which I'm going to show you the list of the 10 lectures that we set up for the month of May, beginning of June. Um, I have to say that we received a lot of positive feedback on doing this, and so we are to do, do this, this continue this series so uh, throughout maybe June, June and July and then we start in September and make a regular event uh, even though not twice a week as, as we are doing this period, period maybe, maybe twice a month, month and, and then, then take it from there. So, so. Right. For those of you that, that don't know me, me uh, most, most of the people, people that are online are actually friends, friends but, but for those of you that have no idea who I am, my name is Alessandra Fajan. I'm, I'm a full professor of applied economics. Of applied economics. So I, uh, I was abroad for quite a long time, 17 years in fact, first, first in the UK and then the US. And, and I came back in 2017 to direct the area of social science at the Grand Sasso Science Institute. The Grand Sasso Science Institute is a doctoral school born, born uh, in 2012-2013, but actually uh, uh, the first three years uh, uh, there were, were spin-offs uh, of the National Institute for Nuclear, nuclear Physics, Physics and, and then in 2016 we became a proper university, a doctoral, doctoral school, school international doctoral school. school. Uh, uh, we, we only teach PhD students, PhD students uh, and we do it uh, completely in English. Uh, and the reason why I came back was because, because this project, project really uh, was something that I cared, I cared about, about and it seemed, seemed such, such a good idea, idea that I decided, I decided to come, come back after so long. So, so as, as I said, said, I'm directing the social science area. I'm also vice provost for research at the GSSI, so I do most stuff that are related to research. Uh, uh, so, so we, the, the title, title of our research, research series is Research Doesn't, doesn't Stop, uh, trying, trying to be proactive and positive. We, we put, put up very quickly a calendar of events that runs from today, May, May uh, 5th, uh, with Ron, as I said, 
to, to uh, the, uh, the beginning, beginning of May. May. And as, as, as you can see, see we have all sorts of different uh, uh, contribution, uh, starting, starting from Ron, Ron of course, let's not talk about smart specialization today, today but going, going to uh, uh, Andrea Bugatti, who is a territorial sociologist, Rachel Franklin, who is a geographer based at Newcastle University, then, then we move on, on to Valeria, Valeria Costantini, who is, who is an economist doing, doing uh, environmental economics uh, uh, subjects. subjects, and then Francesco Rettichini, University of Milan, is going to talk to us about open, open data, and he does research, research in fact, fact, he does also, also on artificial, artificial intelligence and green technology. technology. Mark Partridge, who is the current president of the Regional Association International, whose talk is interesting, given the time, because it's COVID-19 and the implosion of regional Economies. And, then and then we, we finish, finish with two, two geographers uh, uh, and uh, two uh, applied economists uh, uh, from the University of Helsinki, Finland, Hong Kong, Kong uh, Smaria Marino, very good friends of ours, who works in the London School of Economics in the UK, and of course, uh, Phil McCann, who was my previous advisor when I was doing the PhD over 20 years ago, who is also going to talk to us about coronavirus and the link with geography of this content. So, so, as I said, said this, this is just uh, the beginning. beginning. I, have I have to thank, thank Margherita, who is uh, joining us today. She's a, She's a postdoctoral research fellow uh, in, uh, in our, our unit, and uh, she has been really pivotal in organizing and doing all the communication with people. So, thank you very much, Margherita. You are great. And of, and of course, I have to thank Sandra, Sandra as well, who was helping uh, a lot, actually, actually the, main the main responsible of setting up this series. Uh, uh, just uh, to finish, uh, finish uh, a little, little bit, bit of marketing and advertising of our, of our doctoral, doctoral program. program. Uh, um, I've been uh, the, the coordinator of this program uh, uh, till this, this year. year. This, this year, year Sandra Montresor is taking, taking over the coordination of the PhD program, and, and together we decided to fine tune it a little bit and change the name. Uh, uh, so it's now Regional Science and Economic Geography, Geography and, and uh, it's, it's very multidisciplinary. And uh, well, you can read a description of the program on our website uh, with all the great people in the Heritage Committee, and as I said, Ron, just, just join in, in as well. well. So no, let, let me just go back, go back now, now to, to the, the here and yeah. stop the presentation. Sure. So, so this, this is just, just as a matter of a brief, brief introduction, but, but really, really, you know, this, this program wouldn't, wouldn't be successful if uh, people, people like, like you were not interested in joining, joining us. So, so I just want to thank you everybody for joining us and I hope you really enjoy the talk, talk by Ron today. today. Thank, thank you very much, Ron. Okay, okay, I'm going to take, take the work, work now. now. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm Sander Montresor, and, and first of all, let me start. Uh, apologies for the slight delay. delay. Uh, as, as usual, usual we face some technical problems, but uh, luckily we have been able, been able to, to solve them. them. So I, I hope, hope that everybody can, can hear me well. well. And, and uh, also, also see me at, at the moment. moment. If the uh, problems, uh, please uh, just drop me a line uh, in the chat that, that we have here, here so that, uh, I mean, if, if I, I receive some, some kind of signal, signal about problems, I know it. Okay? okay? Uh, having said that, that uh, well, well, first of all, um, um, yeah, yeah, thank, thank Alessandra for your nice introduction. Now it's my turn to introduce Professor Ron Bosma. Uh, it, it is for me indeed uh, an immense pleasure and honor to welcome you here in this, in this webinar series. Conventionally, we, we say that any host speaker does not need uh, any presentation because we are, is already well known. But, but, but I think that Ron does have an exception to this, this welcoming rule, just, just to remind us how much he has contributed, and, and he's still contributing to academic research, and, and therefore how, how lucky we are to have, to have him here today, today uh, though in, in a web format. format. Uh, very, very synthetically, Rob Oshman is professor, professor of regional economics at the University, University, University of the Netherlands, and also professor in innovation studies at the University of Stavanger. In Norway, in Norway, 
and just a terrific piece of new work was run by Thompson Rotter among the top 100 1% researcher in terms of citation worldwide. Okay, uh, very in, in the last 10 years, so really a terrific score. He has got an incredible high impact scientific production, several distinguished membership at the worldwide level. Uh, uh, in scientific association, association journal editorial boards, policy, policy committees, and, and as Alessandro has just said, he has just added among this membership with immense pleasure for us, for us uh, a membership to well, the teaching committee of our doctoral, doctoral program in regional, regional science and, and, and economic geography, geography of which Alessandro has passed me the bottom coordinator this year. Is, 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 is seminar research work on spatial and non-spatial proximity, on the variety and relatedness of regional economic activities, diversification, branching, just to mention a few, as either way to what we nowadays know as evolutionary economic geography and geography innovation in particular. Uh, his work has been uh, fundamental in addressing also uh, the topic of, of today, of this today web seminar, the smart, smart visualization policy, something that Dominique Ferre uh, uh, at the beginning of the debate called the case of policy running ahead of a theory. And, and I think that uh, in, in this story of the policy, which at least was trying to get a theory, basically, basically show us, show us and it's going to show us today as well. As well. That, that research, research can, can contribute, contribute basically, basically to this gap. gap. Okay. okay. So, so uh, smart, smart personalization is going to be this topic, topic and, and how, how we can turn, turn or how, how can we research and uh, turn, turn a smart personalization policy, policy into, into a very, very or more, more smart, smart policy is actually, is actually the topic of, of this presentation. presentation. And, and, and is therefore a rather moment, moment to uh, leave the web floor to him. Before, Before doing, doing that, that uh, let, me let me remind you some, some rules that, that are necessary for an effective working, working uh, of, a of a webinar. webinar. The, first the first thing that I would kindly ask you to teach and everybody of you, of you to mute your, mute your mic, mic uh, if you didn't, you didn't do yet. yet. And, and possibly also turn, turn your, your camera, camera off, off okay? okay? You could, you could eventually, eventually switch them on uh, even, even when, when you would like, like to intervene. intervene. But, but for, for the time, the time being, being, please uh, turn, turn both, both your mic and camera, and camera off. off. Uh, in, terms in terms of rules of the game, the game we, have we have planned to have two kinds, two kinds of interventions. Of interventions. Uh, uh, spotlight, spotlight questions, questions of clarification during round presentation. And then, uh, a more, more articulated set of questions at the end of, end of this talk, talk after a short virtual uh, coffee break. Okay? Okay. In, In both cases, I uh, would we'll ask those of the audience that would like to intervene to drop me a line in, in the chat of this, of this Google, Google Meet, possibly by recording their, their names, names, names so that, so that, that, so that I can know to who I'm expected, expected to give the word. I will, I will do, do my, my best, best to signal this question to run in the most, most appropriate or less inappropriate moment. moment. Okay? okay. Uh, uh, last but not least, before starting, before starting a very important question, an uh, issue, sorry, sorry. I would, I would like, like to remind you that, that we have started, started recording, recording the webinar, webinar uh, as, as we, we plan, plan to disseminate it in our, our website and social, social accounts. accounts. Uh, as you know, in order to proceed further with that, we need, we need to, to have, have your consensus, consensus to make this recording and disseminate, and disseminate your presence and eventual, and eventual intervention. Now, uh, having, having a, a consensus, consensus from each and every body of you, you are more than 50, 50 will be quite, quite troublesome. troublesome. So, so operationally, I would, I would have first ask you to report me still in the chat, chat whether, whether you are against this, this whether, whether someone in this audience is against recording and requires us to protect her privacy in doing that. Okay? Okay. okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry for this, this not a really, really short, short introduction, but, but I think that was a set of things, things that, that uh, was, was worthwhile where, where where to say. say. So, so having, having done, done that, I'm done. done. And, and I finally uh, really, really leave, leave the word, the word to, to run, run for uh, is, is a start. start. Okay? okay? Thank, thank you, thank you, you thank you, you Ron, for your presence here and I keep watching you. 
Okay, okay uh, thank, uh, thank you, you uh, Sandro, uh, and uh, thank, thank you, uh, uh, Sandra, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for the nice introduction, and of course, uh, uh, for the invitation uh, to, uh, to participate and, and, uh, and uh, present uh, uh, some of my work, work uh, uh, on smart, smart specialization policy. policy. Um, okay, okay, we, we had some technical, technical problems before we started, started so, so I, I can't see the slides, slides on my uh, screen, screen yet. yet. So, so Andrea, Andrea could you do that? Do that? So, so I outsource this, this, which is, is a bit weird. weird. So, so I, I just, just have to, have to uh, get in contact, contact with Andrea all the time. All the time. Um, um, yes, yeah, so, so the title of my presentation will be as follows. How to get smart specialization policy smart. It builds a bit on... On work, work I've been, I've been doing, doing uh, also, also for the European, European Commission, Commission. Uh, uh, because they, um, as Sandra already said, uh, uh, quoting uh, Dominique Fauré, uh, that smart specialization policy was implemented quite soon without having a proper theoretical foundation, let alone that, uh, that there was some empirical work that could really sustain uh, the building blocks, the, the main principles of smart specialization policy. So what I would like to do in my presentation is to go a bit into that and, uh, and, and, and to see to what extent we can uh, make smart specialization policy smarter. Okay, uh, please, next slide. Yes, uh, I will uh, um, look at three building blocks if time allows. Uh, I think I have one hour. Uh, uh, to talk, uh, so um, um, I will uh, briefly go through uh, those three mil main building blocks, which to me are quite crucial for an effective smart specialization policy framework. Uh, that is, it should build on local capabilities, we have to account for interregional linkages, and uh, we have also uh, to look at the institutional context in which a smart specialization policy is implemented. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, um, and, and of course, I'm not going to too much into detail in what smart specialization policy is about. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure you have heard about it, uh, you're familiar with it. Uh, so just one slide on that. Uh, it's, a, it's a big uh, policy intervention program at the European scale uh, in which uh, billions of euros are spent on actually this particular program. Uh, uh, we are not always fully aware of that, but it's a massive intervention uh, program uh, by uh, the European uh, uh, um, uh, Commission. Um, it has been part of uh, EU regional innovation policy since 2014. To me, the objective of smart specialization is to develop new specializations in regions or to upgrade existing specializations. Uh, so it's not about uh, uh, um, strengthening existing specialization but this is really about uh, innovation and, and going into new directions um, and that is what uh, uh, smart specialization policy tries to achieve uh, it's a policy targeting uh, uh, potential new activities uh, uh, taking into account the regional capabilities that are present in the region so it's not about building something from scratch uh, but uh, 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 regions are required to identify capabilities that are most relevant and, uh, and when they target particular activities uh, in smart specialization policy, it should be uh, uh, strongly connected to the capabilities that are already present in the region. So it's not just about uh, becoming the new Silicon Valley or just go for artificial intelligence when you have no capabilities whatsoever. Uh, uh, it also means so no one size fits all policy. Uh, um, it's a bottom up strategy in which local stakeholders are also involved in selecting and, 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 and prior, prioritizing uh, potential new economic activities. Uh, it also means that there is no duplication of policy if that is implemented, ideally speaking, right? So, uh, so each region goes for its specific uh, uh, um, strength. And, and exploit that uh, in smart specialization policy. Okay, please, next slide. So, um, what is a, a quite crucial dimension of smart specialization policy is that uh, um, certain activities uh, uh, will be targeted. The ones that can build on existing capabilities that are present in the region. So. There's a need to identify diversification opportunities that can upgrade uh, a regional economy. 
and I will and I will uh, uh, refer to a number of uh, concepts uh, um, that I will also um, link to empirical work I've been doing. First of all, uh, you need to build on local capabilities, and I will use the notion of relatedness uh, uh, doing that. Uh, uh, regions should add new complex activities, so they should make their economies more complex uh, when um, uh, implementing impl uh, smart specialization policy. And they should connect to regions, uh, not per se, but only to those regions that can really provide complementary capabilities. Um, so those will the, be the, uh, uh, the three building blocks uh, that I will uh, devote most attention to. And then at the end, if time allows, I will also say a bit on institutions. Okay, the big question, of course, is how to do this. Um, please, Andrea, next slide. First, uh, start with lo uh, local capabilities. Well, we know from literature that local capabilities conditions which new activities will be feasible to develop in a region. There's a huge uh, and expanding literature, still expanding literature, uh, that emphasizes the fact that uh, uh, the way regions diversify is by building on existing strengths. They, uh, so the probability uh, that you will be successful in developing a new activity is very much depending on the degree of relatedness with existing uh, uh, activities in the region. Um, that, of course, requires uh, a definition of, uh, of relatedness. Well, we follow uh, the literature in that respect, uh, uh, these and others that have emphasized that ac activities are considered related when they share similar capabilities. And so uh, what we derive from that is that the more related a new activity is to existing activities in a region, the lower the cost and the lower the risk to develop this new economic activity. Because you don't start from scratch, you can really build on uh, activities that are already present in the region. It also requires a definition of complexity, right? Because as I said, uh, uh, an objective of smart specialization policy is also to add more complexity to your economy. Well, activities are considered complex when, uh, uh, when they are unique uh, uh, the, uh, and rely on a wide range of sophisticated capabilities. Um, and I will come back to that later, uh, uh, but this is the principle. And the higher the complexity of a uh, uh, new activity, the higher the potential economic benefits for a region. That's why uh, there is this objective uh, to add complexity uh, to your e uh, regional economy in smart specialization policy framework. Please, next slide. So um, we propose a kind of smart specialization framework that takes those two uh, uh, dimensions into account, relatedness on the one hand and complexity on the other hand. And, and, the, uh, and we think that uh, um, um, by targeting specific industries or activities or technologies, uh, you should uh, take those two uh, uh, concepts into account. And I just uh, uh, have here a figure uh, which simplify the matter uh, very much, uh, but I will use this framework uh, for uh, uh, my later pre presentation when I present empirical results. So if a region has to target uh, 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 certain industries, um, it has to decide uh, 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 which industries. Uh, so here's industry J and industry I. In this case, uh, it would be more smart to go for industry J because it shows more uh, relatedness with existing industries in the region. So you have more potential to uh, exploit existing capabilities that are relevant to develop this industry J. And it would add more complexity to uh, the regional economy because industry J is complexer than, uh, more complex than industry I. So this is how we use the framework all the time. This is the basics, and that is how we gonna, are going to apply that empirically. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, a, a framework uh, that we have developed uh, uh, um, in more detail. Um, if you're interested, uh, you can find, uh, I, I put a reference uh, uh, below. Uh, it's a paper published in Regional Studies uh, last year, uh, which outlines the, this, uh, this framework more in detail. Okay, next slide, please. 
So how to identify diversification opportunities in regions? So that is the, the first question. So how can we have identify relevant local capabilities uh, um, uh, in order to make that part of smart specialization policy? Well, um, what's important if you're gonna uh, identify diversification opportunity that you use a, 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 a wide set of different uh, data sets. Uh, because in the past, uh, we have uh, mostly relied on pattern data, which, uh, which um, calculates uh, the, um, the diversification opportunities of regions in terms of new technologies. But as we all know, patterns only cover uh, only a small part of the, of the whole economy. Uh, it's more geared towards high tech uh, uh, sectors, uh, manufacturing uh, industries in particular, and therefore, it might not be a very good indicator uh, to consider uh, when you want to apply smart specialization policy in all types of regions in the European Union, uh, including peripheral regions, which we know uh, tend to patent uh, a lot less uh, than uh, the more uh, core and advanced regions. So what we do uh, uh, in our empirical work is, uh, uh, apart from using patent data, we also use occupational and sector data to identify capabilities in regions that might affect their diversification opportunities. And so you might have opportunities to diversify in new technologies, but also in new occupations and new industries, and we all look at them at the same time. And uh, the way um, uh, we use uh, the notion of relatedness in that respect is that we uh, have to determine to what extent those activities, whether they're technologies, occupations, or regions, industries, share similar capabilities. Next slide, please. Of course, uh, I, could, uh, I, could, I could talk for hours about how to measure relatedness. Uh, there, there are um, um, many different ways of measuring uh, relatedness. Uh, um, um, I just don't go too much into detail for this presentation, uh, but I just want to outline the main principles, how we do it. For technologies, for example, we look at the co-occurrence of technologies on patent documents, which means that if, if, if a pair of technologies reoccur uh, at a high frequency on a patent document, uh, we, def we define them as being related, they must have something in common. And for occupations, industries, uh, it's, it's a bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we follow uh, Hidalgo et al., uh, the 2007 paper, uh, uh, and we use a normalized spatial co-occurrence technique, which basically says, okay, uh, that we say, um, uh, uh, we look at uh, what pairs of uh, sectors or occupations uh, uh, are sim simultaneously overrepresented in the same region. Uh, so um, uh, we use uh, employment shares in that respect, and, and uh, um, we, we calculate correlations of uh, the relative comparative advantage between industries or occupations in all European regions. So the more uh, um, uh, 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 occupations or industry co-locate, the more we define them as, uh, as being related in this approach. Uh, it's a bit more complicated than that, but this is, the, uh, this is more or less uh, the, the general uh, uh, idea behind it. And by doing that, uh, we obtain a measure of degree of relatedness between technologies, between occupations, and between industries. And we can visualize that as a network. Uh, please, Andrea, next slide. Well, here it's, uh, it's for technologies. So, so each uh, node stands for a certain technology. If there's a link between new they, it means they are related above a certain threshold ba based on this co-occurrence analysis. Um, and, and, and as you can see in a network, this typical structure of a network in which some nodes, some technologies are related to many other technologies in the in the more in the center of this uh, uh, network. Well, the ones that are more at the periphery of this network, uh, they are only uh, uh, related to one or two other technologies and not related to any other technologies in this uh, technology space. Um, please, next slide. Well, you can you can do that for occupation space here. I did it for the you all you um, uh, for the European studies we did uh, at the two digit level. I think we have about uh, thirty three occupations, and again, 
uh, um, each node stands for a certain occupation. If there's a link between the two, they're related. If there's no link, they're unrelated. Next slide, please. And the, and the same for industry space, right? For industries, uh, I this is also at the two-digit level. And uh, I think there are about 84 uh, different industries. Uh, the same principle if they, if they are connected uh, um, with a line. I hope you can see it. Uh, um, they're they're related. If uh, if there's no line between them, they're not related. And so, please next slide. And we use that information um, to to see to what extent regions have a potential to diversify into new technologies or new occupations or new sectors. So. Um, this requires a different uh, measure uh, of relatedness, uh, which is more uh, region specific in the sense, and, and, and uh, some of you might already be familiar with this, uh, this indicator of relatedness. Density is a, is a widely used indicator in this literature uh, that measures the relatedness between one activity um, and all other activities in a region. So, um, if um, an, uh, an activity can have an, a minimum value of zero, uh, when that activity has um, um, when that activity um, is not related to any activity present in a region, well, the maximum value would be that an activity is uh, related to all activities that are present in a region. Um, so, and of course, in the latter case, we would expect that the higher the relatedness density, the more likely uh, an activity will enter a region uh, because uh, there are more um, activities related to that potential new one. Um, so that potential new one could really build and exploit those existing uh, capabilities that are already present in the region. So the higher the relatedness density, the more related technology or occupation or sector is to other technologies, occupation sectors in a region, the more potential the region has to develop a new technology occupation and sector. So we calculated this diversification potential for 292 NUTS2 regions, uh, uh, um, distributed among uh, 32 uh, uh, European countries. We took the AU28 and the four EFTA countries. Um, and we did the analysis, uh, at least I will present some analysis for 88 sectors, 40 occupations, and 654 technologies. Uh, please, next slide. And I will just uh, uh, come up with some. Um, ah, okay. First, uh, a measure of uh, uh, complexity. Um, so, so I've now defined the first concept, uh, relatedness, and uh, and how we measure that. Now we go into uh, the complexity. Uh, that is a, there's a huge debate on that. Uh, so of course, again, I, go, I can't go into details in that respect. Uh, uh, there's a lot of debate. What is the right measure of complexity? It's, uh, um, I, I, I think we are not yet there, uh, but uh, there's, has, has been, there's some progress has been made uh, for sure in that respect. When we uh, will define the complexity of technology, uh, we will uh, follow um, the literature by Fleming and Surison, uh, uh, which actually say that uh, uh, they they look at the complexity of a patent, um, and, a, uh, and a, a patent is uh, considered to be more complex. The higher the number of classes, technology classes on a patent, and the more rare the combinations between classes on the patent. Uh, so basically, uh, 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 what it is saying is it looks at combinations between class technology classes that are made and, uh, and the complexity of a techno technology class is defined as whether you uh, when it combines many different other technologies and 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 the more so when those uh, combinations that are made uh, are also very rare um, Apparently, it's complex uh, uh, to do that, and therefore, uh, those are defined as being uh, uh, complex technologies. For occupation and sectors, even more difficult uh, to uh, to come up with a good uh, complexity indicator. We follow a bit uh, the literature uh, uh, by Hidalgo and Hausmann uh, 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 that uh, uh, use an outcome-based complexity measure. It acts, what it takes into account is that uh, uh, complex occupations and complex setters 
uh, they rely on a wide range of capabilities that are concentrated in densely and larger populated cities. It's more or less uh, um, so using the Hidalgo and Hausman approach and, and, and what we combine is also the scaling literature in that respect that is saying that the most complex activities are concentrated in the most densely populated uh, uh, cities. Um, uh, so we use a mixture of those type of uh, uh, reasoning in order to come up with a complexity measure uh, for occupations and sectors. Uh, next slide, please. And then, of course, uh, you have, uh, you have uh, 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 information about uh, the complexities of all technologies, the complexities of all sectors, and the complexities of all occupation. Uh, okay, here I put only the, the top two of uh, the most complex technologies according to our measure, digital communication and biotechnology. It does not come as a surprise. The most complex sectors are computer programming, consultancy and related activity, and activities of head offices. And the most complex occupations, information and communication technology professionals, and business and administration professionals. Just to give you uh, a feeling of yeah, what, 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 uh, um, what activities are most complex. Okay, next slide, please. So, now I just, um, I, I, I'm not going to uh, uh, um, uh, present um, an econometric model, we did that, uh, but I just want to uh, outline more the idea and just give a few examples of how you can actually uh, use this. So here I took the example of Ile de France and here you again, uh, you have uh, on the x-axis, you have relatedness density and on the y-axis complexity. And this is for sectors. And, um, uh, and so we plucked all uh, uh, sectors of Ile de France in this uh, particular graph and how they score on relatedness density and how they score on complexity. Um, so uh, the, the higher the bullet, uh, the higher uh, uh, the relative comparative advantage, which means the more Ile de France is specialized in that particular uh, sector. So as you can see uh, on the top right, uh, um, there is a computer program consultancy and related activities. So apparently Ile de France is highly specialized in that one has an RCA uh, uh, larger than two. And this does not come really as a surprise because it has a high degree of relatedness density, right? So there are many, uh, many sectors present in the Ile de France regions that are related to this computer program consultancy and related activities. So this, uh, this, this sector can really build on uh, relevant capabilities that are present in the Ile de France region. And as you can see, and this is really nice, but also quite exceptional in Europe, is that you have a positive relationship between relatedness density and complexity. So Ile de France is very lucky because it is blessed with many sectors that are highly complex, and that also have a high degree of relatedness with existing activities in the region. And this is very rare, uh, as, as, I will, uh, as I will show later on. So uh, um, um, uh, it, it, the highest potential, uh, the, uh, Ile de France has many diversification opportunities in very complex sectors, because it has a lot of relatedness with existing sectors in the region. OK, next slide, please. Now show you the, uh, the case of Silesia, old industrial region in, uh, in Poland. And here you see uh, um, uh, a negative relationship between relatedness density and complexity. Again, the bullets refer to what extent uh, uh, um, uh, Silesia is specialized in those particular sectors. And as you can see, the bigger the bullet, the more you go to the right, uh, in this particular figure, which makes sense again, because the more relatedness is present in the region, the, the, the more a sector will specialize because it can, it, it's really embedded in the region itself and can really build on relevant capabilities to grow and develop further. Um, and this is actually shown here. But what is the bad thing for Silesia, if you look at the diversification opportunities, is that they might have some diversification opportunities. Uh, on, on, in, in, on below, uh, on, on the right side of this, uh, of this figure. But most of them are uh, um, low complex activities. 
So the highest potential Silesia has to develop sectors that have a high degree of related density are in the in this range of complex, uh, low complex complexity uh, complexity activities. And you might even refer to this, and this is what we observe in many old industrial regions that they seem to be a bit trapped in low complex activities. Um, so as you can see, the the high complex activities they score all very low on relatedness density. So they really don't have a potential. Uh, so Silesia does not really have a potential to develop high complex activities uh, through relatedness. Next slide, please. Here I took the uh, case of Extremadura in the south of Spain um, as a peripheral region, and as you can see again, it's a very different picture. It's a bit messy. Um, as you can see, for all sectors, they, they score pretty low on relatedness density. Uh, so um, here you wonder, okay, what should Extra Madura do uh, in terms of uh, um, um, developing uh, um, new sectors uh, in the region? Um, as you can see, all sectors score uh, pretty low on relatedness density. So there might be even not many opportunities to diversify in related activities, and and uh, let alone uh, uh, make uh, the Extremadura region more complex. Uh, because as you can imagine, Extremadura region is already uh, uh, a low complex uh, uh, economy. Okay, next slide, please. So those were the diversification opportunities of, of sectors. Now uh, I will show some diversification opportunities in occupations, because as you remember, I used three data sets, industries, occupations, and technologies. Here it's for occupation and again for Ile de France. And as you can see, it's still uh, again a positive relationship between relatedness density and complexity. Next slide, please. Silesia for occupation. Again, you see the negative relationship. Uh, between relatedness, uh, density, and complexity. Next slide, please. And here, extra Madura region. Well, here you, for occupation, you can actually see that for industry, as you remember, it's interesting, for industries, uh, all industries scored, scored very low on relatedness density. This is less the case for occupations, right? So, so here you see that it also matters very much what type of data set you use and what type of diversification opportunities really show up. Uh, and, 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 and here, uh, there might be more opportunities for extra Madura uh, to diversify into uh, new occupations that might uh, have a, a, a high degree of relatedness with existing occupations in the region. Okay, please, next slide. Well, here I go into technologies. Uh, there was also a, a specific project I did for uh, for the European Commission together with Pierre Alex Ballon, uh, my Utrecht colleague, and uh, and they wanted us to uh, to find out what is uh, what are the diversification opportunities of European regions to develop C uh, seven key technologies, as they put it, right? So cybersecurity, high performance computing, clean connected and autonomous vehicles microelectronics, batteries, additive manufacturing, hydrogen technologies and systems, those, those seven key technologies. And again, we used uh, the, uh, the, the, the smart specialization framework I outlined before. And here you can see what is the potential again of the Ile de France region to, uh, uh, to, uh, to develop uh, those seven key technologies. And as you can see, there, there's, there, there are huge differences between the seven key technologies. Uh, cybersecurity, okay, again, the higher the bullet, the more Ile de France is already specialized, right, uh, in that uh, particular uh, technology. So yeah, as you can see, it's very strong in cybersecurity. It's a very, it's very complex uh, technology, uh, and it, has a show, it shows a high degree of relatedness with existing technologies in the Ile de France region, so it has a huge potential to develop that further. Well, on the contrary, additive manufacturing, uh, um, the green uh, bullet, uh, it has very low relatedness density. So if we uh, should advise Ile de France region is maybe not, not uh, to address any technologies in additive manufacturing through smart specialization policies, but maybe go for uh, the, the ones that, uh, that score higher on relatedness and complexity. Uh, next slide, please. 
Well, the same for Silesia region, right? I took, uh, took, 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 took that region to illustrate my point. Here you see a very different picture again. Uh, uh, apparently, uh, Silesia is already quite specialized in additive manufacturing and has also highest potential to develop that further. Uh, well, the other key technologies, uh, um, they have not really uh, 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 strong capabilities, uh, local capabilities in those uh, key technologies. Uh, so they might uh, uh, consider not to devote too much attention to those key technologies in their smart specialization strategies. Next slide, please. Well, as you can imagine, Extremadura regions uh, does not really participate heavily in those seven key technologies, so the bullets are, are very uh, small. Uh, it means so there's no specialization whatsoever uh, in the extra Madura region, and uh, what you can actually see that they all score pretty low uh, on relatedness um, uh, in that respect. Okay, next slide, please. Well, you can map that, of course. Uh, here I just took an example. Uh, uh, so we estimated uh, the diversification uh, of European regions in hydrogen technology. And uh, the darker uh, the color, the yellow, uh, the more uh, um, uh, uh, relatedness density uh, that is relevant for uh, hydrogen technology, uh, the more potential this European region has to move into hydrogen technology. OK. Next slide, please. And this for battery technology, right? And as you can see, the, the map changes uh, quite dr drastically from one technology to the other. And this is, of course, what we expect, right? Because regions uh, develop different capabilities over time. And that's why uh, smart specialization policy should be region specific, right? Because each region has different capabilities uh, and can target different technologies or different uh, industries or different occupations in order to develop uh, economically. Next slide, please. Okay, this was the first part. So this was about local capabilities. Do they matter? Yes, they do. Uh, and I just uh, uh, used pattern data, occupational data, and industry data to make the point to see what are the opportunities uh, of European regions to move into new activities uh, and, make, and, and make that part of their smart specialization policy. But of course, not only regional capabilities may be important, but also interregional linkages. And what is also uh, what was already part and partial of smart specialization policy from the beginning is that regions should also have incorporated connections to other regions in their smart specialization policy. It never drew a lot of attention uh, um, uh, among scientists, uh, but it was really all already out there in 2014 when uh, a smart specialization policy uh, was defined and introduced. Um, okay, there, uh, there's a lot to say about the role of interregional linkages and why it is important. Uh, um, it might be the case that, of course, regions might become locked in, they might become too specialized in certain uh, capabilities uh, that they uh, that they might need to connect to other regions in order uh, to get out of this lock-in. Um, the big question then is, uh, can re interregional linkages provide access to missing local capabilities and still positively affect diversification in a region? So, so it might be the case that a region is lacking relevant capabilities to move into uh, biotech, for example, and you might still say, well, it can still get access to uh, uh, capabilities elsewhere in other regions in order to make that happen. Well, the question is how far can a region go into that respect, right? So, um, and what we try to uh, underline, and this is a paper I, I did with Pierre Alex Ballon, uh, also a project for the European Commission. What type of interregional linkages are most crucial uh, uh, for regions to diversify into new economic activities? And what we know, of course, from the literature uh, is that uh, you need a sort of capacity to exploit external knowledge. You cannot just connect to any, any region, but uh, what might be most uh, uh, sensible to do is to connect to, to those regions that provide 
knowledge that is related to yours because then you can understand and you can incorporate, you can integrate it into your existing local knowledge and you can benefit from that mostly. And this is already what we, uh, what Simona, uh, Yamarina and me did in a paper published in Economic Geography in 2009. But this uh, needs to be uh, uh, further developed and that's what, what we uh, try to do in this paper. Okay, please, next slide. So this is a paper, uh, it's still a working paper. Um, um, uh, I, I just put it online um, in our uh, working paper series, Papers in Evolution Economic Geography. So if you're interested, uh, 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 you can just download it uh, uh, from there. Uh, what we did there is uh, we tried to analyze the impact of interregional linkages on technological diversification in European regions while controlling for regional capabilities, right? And what we did um, uh, is, to what extent interregional linkages that give access to additional capabilities in other regions that are complementary to existing capabilities of the region, whether those have a stronger impact on regional diversification, right? So again, what I said before, just connecting to any other regions, but especially those ones that can provide you access to capabilities that are missing in your own regions, but that are complementary to the ones that you already have, because that is what we would expect to have the highest impact. And this is what we are going to test in this uh, particular paper. Uh, next slide, please. So we uh, estimated a regional diversification model. We used the uh, pattern data uh, from the OCD RECPAT data set. We could distinguish between 645, uh, 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 54, um, uh, technology classes uh, among 292 European uh, NUTS2 regions. Uh, it's an entry model, so uh, uh, um, to be the dependent variable is whether you enter, wh whether you develop a new technological specialization or not in a region. And uh, we, uh, we took a relative technolo technological advantage, uh, which is uh, um, a specialization measure. Um, regional capabilities. Uh, have been measured as I explained before. First of all, we used uh, we we calculated the measure of relatedness doing co-occurrence analysis of technologies on a patent document, right? So we constructed a technology space. So uh, determining uh, for each pair of technologies how related they are, the more they co-occur on a patent document, the more they are related. Um, and then we use that information to uh, to measure our relatedness density measure. Which, uh, uh, which measures the relatedness of a potential new technologies to the set of technologies in which a region at uh, time t is already specialized, right? Uh, so the higher the relatedness density, the more likely a new technology will enter that region. Next slide, please. And then uh, we, uh, uh, we constructed two uh, uh, variables of interregional linkages. One is interregional linkages uh, per se, which is just the number of ties a region has with inventors in other regions. So it is the uh, uh, so uh, those those linkages are co-inventor ships, right? Uh, so inventors that uh, uh, collaborated uh, in in different regions. Uh, so that means that they uh, that they have developed the time. And that is how we account for that. So we just uh, calculate the number of ties a region has with inventors in other regions. And then our most important variable is the complementarity in interregional linkages. And this is an indicator that we developed ourselves, um, which is measured as a density of related non-local knowledge in which a region can tap into to diversify in a new technology. So basically, what it is saying is, um, and, and um, at least it, cons uh, um, it uh, consists of two parts. First of all, we measure the relatedness density that all regions J can potentially add to the relatedness density of a region I in developing a new technology T. And then we also look in to what extent also uh, region I is actually connected to all those regions J that can provide complementary capabilities. Uh, um, so I can uh, um, uh, uh, explain that a bit more in detail in the next slide. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, here again, uh, we use the um, uh, uh, 
the smart spatula same work I presented before on the x-axis relatedness, uh, on the y-axis complexity. And now let's assume technology, so uh, region A wants to go for technology I. And it has already local capabilities uh, of 50%. So uh, it scores 50, 50 on relatedness, uh, meaning that uh, let's say that uh, there are um, um, uh, 10 technologies uh, related to technology I. This region A is already specialized in five of out of those 10 related technologies. So that's why it scores 50 on relatedness. And now what we are interested in is if it connects to other regions, how much of that relatedness could be added to the existing relatedness a region already has in order to develop this new technology I. So if in this case, in this example, uh, um, uh, region A would connect to region B, B it would add 30% relatedness density to the 50% it already has. If it would connect to region C, it would add 20%. If it would connect to region D, it would add 10%. So we are actually looking at to what extent other regions can provide complementary capabilities that are missing in region A, and that region A could get access to by developing a co-inventor linkage to, uh, to those regions. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the main findings of the entry model that we estimated. Uh, uh, the first uh, row, as you can see, um, yeah, is relatedness density. Well, there's always a positive and, uh, and, and significant effect, right? So, uh, and this is, uh, is confirming uh, any other study that has done that, uh, has included this variable. The higher the degree of relatedness, the more a technology is uh, uh, likely to enter a region. And then we come to our two uh, variables uh, of interregional linkages. In, uh, in column two, uh, um, um, you can actually see that the number of interregional linkages really uh, has a positive effect on the probability of a uh, new technology entering a region. So if you're connected to other region, it might uh, in, indeed have a, have a positive effect on regional diversification. But as you can see, if we uh, include our complementarity measure of interregional linkages, then uh, complementarity of interregional linkages has a, has a positive effect, a significant effect on the probability entry of a new technology in a region. But as you can see, the number of interregional linkages variable uh, 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 becomes negative. Uh, so saying that it's not. Uh, um, per se uh, needed to connect to other regions. In fact, it might even have a negative effect because it comes at a cost. So you might connect to the wrong regions uh, that cannot uh, uh, provide any uh, capabilities that you need to develop a new technology. But the, the regions you connect to that can provide complementary capabilities that are missing in the region, that has a strong and positive effect on, uh, on uh, and regional diversification. We also estimated an interaction effect between relatedness density and complementarity of interregional linkages, the, the, gr the green variable, um, because we wanted to also to know whether there's a substitution effect or a complementarity effect, right? So it might be, so we would not expect that if you have zero relatedness density, that you can still make that up by uh, tapping knowledge uh, in other regions that can provide complementary capabilities. Um, what we expect is uh, uh, they're, they're both complement uh, to each other. And in fact, that is what we find. We find uh, an, uh, an, a positive and a significant fact in column four, as you can see, uh, as a positive and significant coefficient, meaning that uh, 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 relatedness density, uh, uh, the effect of uh, relatedness density is stronger when uh, 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 the complementarity of interregional linkages. Okay, next slide, please. So there's also a huge debate, at least in economic geography, to what extent uh, peripheral regions uh, uh, um, um, have uh, capabilities to diversify 
right? Um, so that's also what we looked at. So, so we included uh, a number of variables that look at peripheral regions. Uh, uh, those are uh, uh, colored uh, in red in, this, uh, in these estimations. Uh, the same setup uh, as I presented before, but we just added the red uh, uh, variables into the estimation framework. And as you can see, peripheral regions, the dummy is, uh, is, uh, is negative, meaning that peripheral regions tend to diversify less in new technologies, which is not unexpected, of course, uh, but we find uh, uh, um, uh, strong and robust evidence for that. Uh, but what we are interested in is also to, uh, if you interact uh, peripheral, uh, the variable peripheral regions uh, uh, with relatedness density and with our variables of interregional linkages, what we can see in column one is that uh, we do not find evidence of a possible effect of regional capabilities, uh, whether that is stronger or weaker in peripheral regions, right? That is not what we find. In the second column, however, as expected, uh, this model two shows that the possible effect of interregional linkages on diversification is stronger in peripheral regions. So apparently, peripheral regions rely more than on average on external interregional linkages uh, in order to diversify into new technologies. And this is very much in line with literature stressing that peripheral regions tend to lie, rely more on interregional linkages because their own capabilities might be weaker. And um, in the third uh, uh, and the fourth specification of, uh, of the models, uh, we uh, interact the peripheral with uh, complementarity of interregional linkages. And what you can actually uh, observe there, that there is also a positive and significant relationship with complementary interregional linkages in peripheral regions. And I think this is interesting, uh, as it suggests that while peripheral regions tend to diversify less in general, once they connect to regions that provide capabilities complementary to existing capabilities in peripheral region, it will increase the probability of peripheral regions to diversify in new technologies. So apparently, interregional linkages are important for peripheral regions to diversify, and the more so if they connect to regions that can provide complementary capabilities. Next slide, please. So how to incorporate this, this notion of interregional linkages in smart specialization policy? Yeah, that is then the question. We find some evidence that it indeed matters. Uh, so, um, and we built, uh, we developed a complementarity measure in this working paper that we already, that I already outlined before, which can actually assess for each technology that a region wants to prioritize in its smart specialization strategy, to what extent other regions in Europe have complementary capabilities that are missing in the region itself. Um, and this, of course, might be very useful to identify a strategic partnership that a region can develop with other regions, given the capabilities that are present in other regions. So it's not just that you connect to other regions because you like a few persons there and you're socially proximate in that respect, because that is what you often see happening. When, uh, when strategic partnerships are developed in regions. But here uh, uh, we say you have to account for missing capabilities in your own regions and which regions can provide complementary capabilities that you might need in order to diversify into a new technology. Uh, next slide, please. And then you can really make some really nice maps uh, for, uh, and you can make thousands of maps of this for each technology. Uh, this is a, a complementarity map, which actually shows for the Ile-de-France region. If the Ile-de-France Ile region wants to develop new hydrogen technologies, I'm here looking at what European regions it could connect to in order to uh, get access to complementary capabilities that are missing in the Ile-de-France regions, but that are crucial to develop new hydrogen technologies. Well, as you can act actually observe, there are a few regions at the eastern part of France, uh, in the southeast of France, in the, south, uh, in the northeast of France, but also a number of German regions. But let's say that you could already, uh, Ile-de-France could already maybe make a national program 
on new hydrogen technology and interact with a few French regions that um, have capabilities that are missing in the Ile-de-France region, but are complementary to the ones that Ile-de-France region already has. And that will significantly increase the, uh, the, uh, the opportunity of the Ile-de-France region to diversify successfully in new hydrogen technologies. Um, next slide, please. Well, you can do that for all technologies. As I said, we have in our data set, we have more than uh, almost 700 technologies, but we can also look at key technologies as I outlined before. Here, uh, uh, I, I, a, a similar map, but now for new battery technologies, right? So for the Ile de France region, which I uh, made black, uh, where are the regions that can provide complementary capabilities uh, that the Ile de France region does not have? but other regions can provide. So Ile de France regions should connect to those in their smart specialization strategy. Uh, the ones that are uh, 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 more red colored can provide those complementary uh, capabilities that Ile de France region does not have. Okay, next slide, please. So we think this information is very useful and to identify and select other regions as the most relevant strategic partners in smart specialization strategies because of complementarities in their capabilities, right? This is what we are after. And I think we, this could be made part of a new framework for smart specialization policy in which we also account for the role of interregional linkages. So we don't lo only look at what regional capabilities does the region have itself, but what kind of connections it could make to other regions in order to increase its relatedness density, in order to move into uh, new technologies. So I think this shed light, new light on the need to make connections between regions, uh, but it would also shift smart specialization policy from uh, just making interregional connections per se to the exploitations of complementarities that exist in other regions. And they are really tailored made because they are very specific and related to the technologies that a region wants to uh, uh, aim at in smart specialization policy. Uh, next slide, please. Now I'll go, I'll go to the third building block, right? Uh, in smart specialization study. So far, I've looked at regional capabilities. Then I moved into interregional linkages. And now the third building block will be about institutions. And if, if we know, uh, if we, we all know that institutions do matter. They do matter for regional diversification. And you could also say that the effectiveness of any smart specialization policy heavily depends on the institutional context in which it is implemented. So, uh, of course, there has been many works on this, uh, especially by uh, Andres Rodriguez Posey has, of course, uh, done uh, uh, dozens of papers uh, measuring institutions differently uh, across Europe and to what extent that differs uh, for regional economic development. Um, the quality of government data, for example, is, uh, is, an, uh, is, an, is an indicator that there has been uh, heavily used in that respect and also different uh, uh, um, uh, indicators of, of social capital. Um, next slide, please. So I, I just want to outline very briefly because uh, uh, I might still have 10 minutes left uh, or five minutes left. Uh, I'm looking at Sandro. <laughs> uh, I, I, you still have, uh, well, let's say 15 minutes. Ah, minute. good. Okay. okay. Okay, thank you. So um, this is a paper that we did uh, and was published in the Journal of Economic Geography a few years ago uh, with uh, Nicolo Cortinovis, uh, Ying Chao, uh, and Frank van Oort. Um, and uh, there we did, we looked at regional diversification in Europe. We, we actually used industry data uh, in order to see to what extent the quality of government and social capital uh, might be uh, um, important for regional diversification. Um, there we could include uh, uh, 13 European countries uh, and um, make a distinction between 118 
uh, NATS2 regions um, covering the period 2004-2012. Uh, we estimated uh, the effects of quality of government, uh, which is uh, probably, you, you know, that data set that, that has been developed in Gothenburg, uh, which uh, is based on survey data on the quality of governance, impartiality and corruption uh, at, at, at European regions. Uh, 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 could you show the next slide, please, Andrea? So here I just uh, uh, show the map. Uh, which shows uh, quality of government uh, uh, in 2017. Uh, I, 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 I copied that from uh, Caron and La Puente. Uh, and um, uh, this shows uh, how the different uh, regions score uh, low or high on quality of government. And you can imagine if you want to implement smart specialization policy, you more or less have to account for that, uh, to what extent actually there is governance quality in the region uh, in order to uh, to make uh, smart specialization policy effective uh, can you go please back to the previous slide thank you so we use those quality of government data and then also we use uh, social capital data and we made the distinction between bridging and bonding social capital in this paper uh, which follows more or less the putnam olson literature uh, looking at uh, um, uh, the density of associ associational activity in regions, um, where they look at membership of different type of associations in the regions that are uh, associated with either bridging social capital or bonding social capital. Bridging social capital is more about um, inclusiveness in societies, as you as, uh, uh, as you might put it. Uh, it's uh, it's about to what extent societies in a, in, a, in a region tend to cross borders between different groups in societies. Um, if, if you do so, you score high on bridging social capital, and those are associated with so-called bridging associations. Uh, in the literature, they are referred to as Putnam groups. Uh, those might be uh, memberships of, uh, of people uh, uh, in cultural activities or youth work. So, those tend to bring together uh, citizens from different strata of, of societies and therefore they are, uh, uh, they are defined as being inclusive associations. Well, bonding social capital is more about membership within each group and there's hardly any interaction between different groups in society. So it is calculated that the share of respondents that are volunteering in bonding associations the so-called Olsen groups, uh, which is uh, more about professional associations, for example, that just represent one particular interest in society, and, and they are referred to as, uh, as, uh, as bonding social capital. Okay, those are the measures uh, that we used. Uh, I, I, can't, I cannot go too much into detail in that, uh, but if you have a question, of course, uh, I'm willing to trust those. Please, uh, next slide. Or yeah, and, uh, and then the next one. Thank you. So these are the, 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 the main findings. Uh, um, okay, so uh, density. Is a, is a, is a, that is related to density measure I, I, I talked about before. As you can see, it's always uh, positive and significant, uh, meaning that the higher related to density, the more likely you are uh, 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 developing new specialization in a new industry uh, at a regional scale. The quality of government indicator is, uh, is EQI, right? And as you can see, it's never, never significant in all model specifications, meaning that quality of government does not have an effect on regional diversification. Well, our trust variable as a positive effect and bridging and bonding social capital, the main two variables of interest, we can actually see that bridging social capital has a, uh, has a, a, a positive and significant uh, coefficient, while bonding uh, social capital has a negative uh, coefficient, but it is not significant. So uh, it's what seems to matter is bridging social capital that has a positive effect on regional diversification in, in European regions. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then we wanted to uh, go a bit more into detail into that respect, because as, as I said before, this quality, this quality of government indicator was non-significant, right? So it had no effect on regional diversification. And now I, uh, um, uh, uh, we defined it uh, in this uh, uh, model specification, we defined it the full, ex uh, the full sample uh, of our observations into a subsample of low quality of government, which means the regions below the 25 percentile of quality of government, and uh, a subsample of high quality of government, which includes all uh, regions above 75 percentile of the quality of government. And this is indicated by in the, in the, uh, the, the row, uh, the first row with a low AQI, so that uh, represents uh, the subsample of low quality of government, and high EQI, which represents uh, the subsample of high quality of government. And now we want to see to what extent uh, 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 the results still hold. And what, what is interesting to see, if you look at bridging and bonding social capital uh, results, is that brid bridging social capital has, again, a positive uh, uh, um, a significant effect on regional diversification, but even more so in the subsample of low uh, quality of government. So bridging social capital seems to be more important in regions with a low quality of government. So at least it can compensate uh, for the low quality of government, although we saw that low quality of government had no effect on regional diversification. Well, what's interesting to see is that by bonding social capital, as you remember in the previous specifications, bonding social capital had no effect. But now, uh, for at least the subsample of low quality of government, it has turned into a negative effect. So meaning, if you have a region that has a low quality of government and high bonding social capital, it has a negative effect on regional diversification. So it seems to be the kind of worst case that you can imagine in terms of regional institutions, that you have a combination of uh, quality, low quality of government and bonding social capital. Uh, if, uh, the, if the two are combined, it has a negative effect on uh, uh, the probability that you, you will develop a new industry in the region. Well, as you can see, bridging social capital is very crucial in that respect, because uh, um, even when in regions with a low quality of government, this uh, uh, bridging social capital still has a uh, positive and significant effect on uh, regional diversification. Uh, okay, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so uh, conclusions. Uh, uh, for the third building block, at least just based on one paper, right? So I think we need ma many more papers on it in order to uh, come to, uh, to to come to strong conclusions. This is this is just one paper. Um, so is uh, at least uh, uh, estimating the effect on regional diversification. Um, so uh, there seems to be a positive effect of bridging social capital. No effect of bonding social capital. No general effect of low quality of government. But as I said. But low quality of government, bridging social capital uh, has a stronger positive effect, while bonding social capital turns into no effect, from a no effect into a negative effect. So this is the worst case scenario I was talking about before. Um, okay, next slide, please. I think I'm done. Yes. Okay, thanks for your attention. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much, Ron, for this very interesting, illuminating talk. I like, I like it very much. The nice sort of recap that you made of, 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 of the concept of the beginning and also the, say, uh, new part towards the end. Uh, I think that uh, what we could do now unless there are sort of uh, instantaneous or spotlight question uh, we could actually have a sort of virtual break of of five minutes and then um, see whether we can have a more relaxed question to address right uh, so let me see in the chat whether we do have uh, uh, Eastern question, though, we have a lot of uh, 
thank you from the participants uh, to run for each talk great presentation from Vasilis. many thanks for matter so but if there are no say instantaneous or or, or spotlight question for clarification uh, what about if we take uh, without disconnecting please just unmute and and uh, and freeze for a little while and then we recollect together in five minutes is that okay run for you first of all huh? because you are the speaker is, is that okay yeah that's fine uh, i mean I, I i could continue i mean it's not a problem but if you yeah, find five minutes break, okay we, we, we can we can just take uh they say that following uh, lectures or seminars in your web is more tiring than in person. So I'm, I'm concerned about that. And therefore I would uh, yeah, um, suggest to take just a five minutes break. So we can recollect all together at uh, half past 11, okay? See you in a while then. Okay, yeah. all right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye Here I'm back again. I, I was told by Claudia on the chat that I say, let us take a break for a cup of wine. Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, did, I didn't mean a cup of wine, of course. <laughs> But we are having a lot of person participating, Ron, more than 50, so very good, very good. Let us see if we can... But it, was, uh, it was a pity, though, that... Uh, um, of course, I would have preferred much more to come to, uh, to La Aquila and do yeah, the presentation. Was, uh, yeah. Right, so this is always... Uh, yeah, I, f I feel a bit stupid now and then just to talk to a screen all the time. Yeah, come on. <laughs> it's a sort of second best solution. I mean, it's really a shame no. that we can't have you in person, but at least we can see each other through 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 a monitor, right? So that that's good. Uh, so let me check on uh, on the chat whether we already have some question uh yeah i don't know first of all let me check uh, oh we should wait two minutes more maybe uh but i got already one question uh which some 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 more question remember please wrap me in the chat posing your name and surnames before so that i can 
know your identity and present you to Ron. I, of course, have a couple of questions too, uh, but I will queue and put myself at the end. Right, let me close the door. Right, and then uh, I, I think, I, I, I don't know whether I um, said this before, but uh, I would actually, I could give a word to the person who has uh, actually booked a talk, okay? So uh, that person could, uh, of course, switch on uh, the mic and, and, and the camera as well, if you want, and, and uh, he, he or she can talk when I will uh, refer to him or her. Uh, for example, to start with, I got a, a question. Oh, Attila Varga, thanks you, Ron. <laughs> Congratulations for the yeah, it's hot. Uh, yeah, good, good. It's, it's, it, I, I never I use this uh, meet, uh, but uh, normally you can uh, also reply to the uh, person in, uh, uh, but here I can only send uh, a message to everybody. Yeah, yeah. Okay, which is strange. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, the, Nicola Matteucci, would you would you would you like to pose your question directly to Ron? Nicola, are you there? Or or not yet? Not yet. Can you hear me? You hear me, Ron? Yeah, you can hear me. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. But Nicola is actually posed a question uh, in in the in the chat, and I was thinking whether he want to pose him himself rather than me read it. Uh, I don't know. Um, okay, I, I will pose him myself. Nicola Matucci says, "Run, uh, what is the received knowledge, if any?" Uh, on the relationship between related density and digital infrastructure on developing new specialization. Uh, I think this refers to, uh, yeah, interlinkages, the, the, the issue about interlinkages. Yeah, I think uh, it's, a, it's a very good question, right? I don't think uh, there's much out there yet. Uh, so, uh... Uh, indeed, what you could uh, do and you, what you might expect, indeed, that uh, the more digital, uh, the more well-established the digital infrastructure is, the more you would expect that the effect of relatedness density uh, will be higher, right? So, uh, um, so that, um, yeah, that, that you can test, right? So, when the data are available, I, I can only remember a paper that was recently published by uh, Artu Santualo uh, at uh, TIC in Oslo, uh, who looked, uh, and with Fulvio Castellacci, uh, um, they looked at e-skills uh, at regional. Uh, so, I mean, it's not really infrastructure, but uh, I don't think they looked at infrastructure, but more the e-skills of persons. Uh, but, okay, there is some connection uh, between the two, I guess. Uh, the higher the e-skills around in the region, the more, the better probably the digital infrastructure is. And they, uh, they, they found, uh, they found a positive effect, uh, uh, positive interaction effect. Uh, so, so, um, and they did it indeed in this diversification uh, uh, analytical framework. Uh, so uh, that is the, the paper I could think of. Uh, other papers maybe that, uh, that, um, that are a bit related, but maybe not too much. Is uh, well the the paper you did, uh, Sandro, with uh, with Francesco on uh, on general purpose technologies, right? So to what extent, indeed, there is an interaction effect between relatedness density and general purpose technologies. So I think comes also close, maybe, to the question that was posed. Uh, and indeed, you find also a very strong and positive effect. Uh, uh, so the the more Regions also uh, endowed with journal purpose technologies, the stronger the effect of relatedness density on on regional diversification. So, uh, so, uh, but th th those are the two studies that come in my mind right now. Right? But I, I, I cannot think of any study that really looked at 
digital infrastructure and uh, establish a sort kind of interaction effect uh, with the related density to see to what extent it has an uh, impact on uh, developing new specializations in regions. If, if I remember well, Ron, if I can add, uh, there should be something by Davide Consoli, Fulvio Castellacci on the role of the e-skills for, for green tax specialization rather than technological specialization in generic terms. Yeah, I think the e-skills paper that I was referring to, I think uh, David was also a co-author on that respect. But right. indeed, you, you're right. They did it also on green technologies. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. So any, any other question? Any other question from the floor? I see you there. 52 person. Come on. Anybody uh, willing to take this great opportunity of raising a question to run this is an opportunity not to be missed you have it here available for another 25 minutes so don't miss this opportunity uh if there are no uh, I, I might actually pose a question myself run i was really very uh interest interest uh, run are you there uh, I, I don't yeah, yeah. Okay. I was very much interested by uh, this, this paper on, on uh, inter-regional linkages. I, I think it's really um, a very important piece in the story of smart specialization because what you're actually doing is finally putting connectedness into the smart specialization story because you, you are right. I think that it was, a, it was always there since the beginning, you know, claiming that regions need to be also open right in order to be smart but the, at least to, to the best of my knowledge it was never qualified of operationalized right in which sense or to which extent they need to be open in such a way to develop a smart specialization strategy so to me that's really uh, an, an important point and I also like the way fully coherent with the density relating the story, the coherent way in which you actually address the issue. On the other hand, I'm wondering uh, to which extent this idea could be extended out of the technology domain, so to say, because the, the means that you have there, right, that somehow guide the linkages, so the means that that, ex, that that guide the exchange across regions here it's, are basically science of technology based uh, kind of linkages right which make geography irrelevant to a certain extent and actually it might be the case that the regions might want to connect with another region right which is complementary in terms of capabilities it's not that crucial whether this region is distant because this kind of codified knowledge can travel in an email or a website right so basically these kind of interregional linkages are somehow neutral with respect to the geography of, of relationships but on the other end we might have other interlinkages relationship which are less intense uh, of codified knowledge, less based on science, technology, say, uh, uh, kind of kind of exchanges, and for which instead the geography uh, could be uh, more relevant. I'm wondering to which extent your argument could be somehow extended to other kind of less, say, technology or science technology related relationships. Uh, yeah, should I answer? Uh, I mean, I think uh, if, if you want, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> um, at least with the first question, I don't know whether there are then other questions. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, of course, uh, what, um, uh, what we, um, okay, this, this paper on interregional linkages is basically the first paper uh, that we do uh, uh, using this type of framework and using uh, this, these new measures uh, that we developed. It was already pretty hard to come to, uh, to that. Uh, and of course, pattern data are excellent uh, because you can actually measure flows, right? So uh, across regions uh, through co-inventorship, co-patterning, uh, you could also uh, use uh, citations, right? So, uh, so that those are actually uh, very good. Uh, to what extent uh, um, uh, regions actually use uh, uh, linkages 
uh, with other regions uh, that can provide complementary capabilities. And there you might even go, become even more concrete and say, okay, uh, you could also look at the organizations, right? So that uh, that are uh, present in other regions that uh, that can make a difference in that respect. So there's still a lot of work to be done also on that, but that is also indeed only looking at technologies. As I uh, also included in uh, in the, the local capability story, it was also that we should not only use patent data and technologies, but also indeed uh, look at uh, um, industries or, or, or occupations. Well, okay, then of course you run already a bit more into problems, right? Because how can you uh, how can you uh, look at linkages uh, between regions? Uh, 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 between sectors and, and between occupations. Uh, of course, the, the, the most obvious one would be uh, labor mobility. Uh, but as you know, uh, those are uh, not available at the European scale. Uh, but you can, you can do this type of analysis uh, within countries, right? So you, there are labor statistics available uh, in countries uh, where you can actually uh, um, uh, investigate labor mobility. Uh, so, so it can be done. Uh, but then, of course, you have to stick to uh, to one particular country. I, I, I cannot really see right now how we could do that at the European level. Uh, another, th um, of course, you could also use trade data, right, uh, between sectors. Uh, but as you know, those are trade data, right? So they're international. Uh, so it means that uh, um, uh, you cannot, of course, uh, the, see the linkages between regions within one country. Well, there might be an alternative. Eh? There are now people very much uh, working on world input-output data. Uh, uh, my colleagues uh, Bart Loss, for example, at Groningen University. And indeed, we are now thinking about doing a project together, trying to account for uh, um, those input-output linkages and to see to what extent sectors are indeed connected between regions and to what extent those are complementary uh, linkages. Right. So. Uh, um, so yes, uh, but I, I see this, uh, it's a very relevant question that, that, you, that you raise. Uh, I see this as a kind of starting point, uh, which will turn into a really new research. <coughs> uh, because a smart specialization policy has not really dealt with this issue, right? They have sometimes referred to value chain uh, uh, issues, uh, uh, but as we all know, uh, yeah, we don't really have strong indicator strong measures uh, in order to incorporate that and make uh, smart specialization evidence-based right so that is because that is what we want to do right in the end that's yeah. what we yeah. that's why we do this type of empirical studies to provide some empirical foundation of the type of uh, uh, strategies that are implemented in smart specialization policy so so there there uh, so uh, it's a very relevant question that you raised, and I think we are only at the beginning of exploiting that, but for us very much rely on our creativity as researcher, but also on the availability of data. Sure, sure. So in the meantime, people seem to have warmed up. I've received a number of questions, both in the chat here and from the YouTube where we are streaming the event. Uh, Andrea Belmartino, are you, are you there? Would you like to raise your question yourself because you have a reading, but maybe that you want to um, actually put you the question yourself, Andrea? Are you there? Can you hear me? If if you can hear me, you can switch your mic on and read your question. Or yes. <laughs> Hello. Uh, can go, you hear go, me? Ahead. go ahead. Yes, we can hear you, Andrea. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was thinking if the, there is a region that if it is highly concentrated in a few number of sectors uh, in terms of value change, value change, uh, if there is a way to control it and also if, if uh, it could affect the diversification opportunities. Thank you. Uh, sorry, I missed the first uh, part because the sound was, uh, was away. Sorry. Could you please uh, read? Yeah, if, if, there, if a region is highly concentrated in a few number of sectors uh, in terms of value chain, if there is a way to control it and if it could affect the, the diversification opportunities or not. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, that's a very good question, right? So, yes, we, uh, we try to account for that, right, for, uh, for diversity. 
right? That is uh, that is present at the regional scale because you can imagine that uh, if there's only one sector in a region, of course, diversification opportunities are much less uh, than for a region that has uh, that has uh, that has many uh, um, uh, sectors in a region because many more combinations can be made, right? Uh, between uh, between those sectors. So that is already very relevant information, I would say, right? So, uh, um, uh, so it means that uh, also in that respect, uh, regions have different diversification opportunities. But you should also account for that in your diversification model uh, by uh, by uh, uh, controlling uh, for for diversity in that respect, uh, uh, because it might just be because of diversity that that uh, that regions will diversify more. But what you're more interested in is to what extent those are the ones that are related, right? So uh, matters uh, in that respect. So, uh, so indeed, in, uh, in 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 a number of studies, you actually control for that. So I think it's a it's a it's a very good question. Yes. Right. So we have a question from our YouTube streaming from Indonesia. Wow, Aristian Wibisono, uh, which tells, "Hi, professor. May I know whether?" As we have a specific strategy aim at region with structurally weak, less developed regional states. So, what kind of strategy do they use? <laughs> a question from Indonesia, possibly about um, capacity extending the S3 idea to uh, say less developed countries or, or less developed regions. Yes. Well, that's uh, of course a very good question, right? Which I probably uh, we. All struggle most right now with right so it's uh, let's say it's the as you said structurally weak regions or less developed regions um, as I, I saw so uh, I, I mentioned some specifications in my model taking into account peripheral regions in Europe right so to what extent well we actually observe that they tend to diversify less but what I think was interesting from the interregional linkage paper that you could actually see uh, that they 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 rely more on interregional linkages to uh, to diversify successfully. So I think that might have policy implications, right? So uh, that we still have to think about how 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 you could actually implement that in policy. Uh, but this is this is I think it's an important uh, uh, contribution by itself, which of course needs to be repeated, right? In in other papers in order to really make a strong claim in that respect. But I think that this is uh, this is a good starting point. So, so with capabilities, so, uh, so less developed regions might not have that strong capabilities in general, uh, and might also be, uh, as I showed in the beginning of my presentation, might also have uh, the Extremadura region, you, maybe you remember, right, that had not very strong capabilities in any technology, uh, in any industry, but for sectors, uh, sorry, for occupations, it showed some, uh, some, some, uh, some opportunities. So for me, uh, uh, if we if we zoom into less developed regions and how to develop a smart specialization policy, you all also all, you all have to take that into account. What are the local capabilities present in peripheral regions, in less developed regions? Are there still opportunities around in those regions that we can build on in order to make them diversify? Uh, 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 we should connect to other regions that can provide complementary capabilities because they do seem to matter and even more so for less developed regions. So we should account for that in smart specialization policy. And then the, the, the most difficult part is on regional institutions, right? So because many less developed regions also have poor institutions, right? They have weak institutions. Uh, um, so um, uh, uh, in general, right? There might be exceptions, but in general, it's the, it's the case. So how to deal with, uh, how to make uh, an effective smart specialization policy in regions that do not really have strong uh, uh, institutions, right? I, I, I have I visited a number of regions myself in Europe uh, where there indeed was, there, there were weak institutionally speaking, and then it, then it becomes difficult, right? So how do you implement that in a, in a, in a region where there's a lot of corruption, uh, in which uh, um, uh, newcomers do not have access uh, to powerful uh, networks. Uh, those those networks in those less developed regions tend to be very uh, closed and, uh, and 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 not that uh, um, diverse. Uh, 
right? So, uh, uh, so that is really a challenge. Uh, uh, so I think, therefore, smart specialization policy should also do something about the quality of governance in the region, right? So, uh, uh, um, so that's why I think those three building blocks that I talked about are quite crucial, right? So it's what local capabilities do less developed regions have? What, what can interregional linkages mean to them? Well, they, they might seem to, the, the, the research I was uh, pointing out, they, they, they tend to indicate that it might be quite crucial to, to, to account for interregional linkages in smart specialization policy. And then about the institutions, get, in, get the institutions right. Uh, or even you might still, uh, if the if the the local institutions are that poor, uh, maybe then um, a national uh, policy has to step in, right? So and and, and do something about that. Uh, uh, so, but this of course is a major challenge. Uh, that is not easy uh, to solve. Uh, but it's a very relevant question and probably the most challenging one in order to uh, to think about a very successful smart specialization strategy. Right, so other question. Uh, I'm, I'm quite, quite excited. I have a, a question from Giuseppe Tesoriere, my former university, University of of Vienna. Nice to see you there, Giuseppe. You can get. Nice to see you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Yes, thank you, Sandro. Thank you, Professor, for the presentation. So, just a question relating to the social capital you mentioned before in the last slide. You mentioned that uh, social capital may compensate the low capability of government in such a way. So my question is, in your opinion, social capital may have a stronger effect in less developed area? And if yes, there are any evidence, maybe in your analysis, uh, that there is a, um, a, a relation between social capital and GDP also of the area? All of the of the sample you observed. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for your question. I think uh, it's a very relevant one. Uh, now, what we looked at is um, um, a diversification, right? So, what what I mean, this is a quite crucial variable, right, for smart specialization policy. How to identify opportunities to move uh, into new activities uh, in order to make regions more diverse, make them more resilient for economic shocks, uh, etc. Et um, let me see. Um, no, I don't have it here with me. Uh, I think we also looked at, uh, at GDP and GDP growth uh, at, uh, at the regional level and to what extent that has a connection with social capital. Um, I, I think there was a positive relationship between the two, but I am, but but that's that's an other dependent variable. Of course, not it's relevant, right? Because what you also want to see to what extent the regions that diversify most also, in the end, will uh, have higher economic growth uh, uh, and things like that. Uh, so uh, it's a very relevant question. Um, in fact, this last question that I just posed, uh, uh, there's not been much research about that. Uh, so this is, I think, uh, still an issue that needs to be uh, uh, researched more. Um, so, um, uh, but this, uh, the, uh, I think we also had some control variables. I, I, I cannot recall uh, um, to what extent uh, there's a correlation also between social capital at the regional scale and, and, uh, and GDP uh, per capita, but uh, I, I cannot exactly recall, but, uh, but I think it's a very relevant point. Thank you. Right, thank you. Then uh, in my chat list, uh, there was a question from Adriana Carolina Pinade, which uh, uh, looks similar to the question already posed. I don't know whether, that, Adriana, you want to add more on that? Or is it okay? Adriana is no more there. Okay, let, let us pass to Hugo. Hugo Rossi is professor in our GSSI social science area. Hugo, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Please go ahead with question. Thank you, Sandro, and thanks, Ron, for uh, this uh, fantastic lecture. Uh, I would like to ask you, against the backdrop of the current pandemic, if you envisage uh, a stronger role of national government, uh, turning uh, 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 your uh, smart specialization strategy into something in a way similar to growth poll strategies that were adopted after the Second World War. 
in which the state played such uh, a strong role. Of course, things are very different nowadays, but uh, if, the, if you envisage this uh, stronger role of the state, uh, possibly also because of uh, a kind of retreat or uh, even uh, uh, deepening of the crisis of the Eurozone and of the European Union. Thank you. Yes, a uh, very good question. Thanks, Hugo, and uh, good to see you. <laughs> um, uh, no, it's, I think it's a very relevant question, right, to the role of national government. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, I think uh, governments in general uh, will play a much more important role in the future. I'm sure about that, right? Uh, this, this is, uh, there was already a tendency among economists to embrace more industrial policy, right? Uh, Mariana Mazzucat is, of course, one of the, uh, the, the proponents and promoters of that type of policy. But I think uh, if I look around, there is much more sympathy uh, for an active industrial policy. And that is actually what the smart specialization policy is also promoting. But it is doing so at the, at the, at the European level. So it's interesting, right? So in, at, let's say in my country, in the Netherlands, uh, there was never really a very strong industrial policy because we had economists that didn't really believe in that, right? But fortunately, we had the European Commission that was actually doing it. Uh, and that's what, that's what I like about uh, smart specialization policy because I think there's a very important role for, for, for governments uh, to, to be very active in that respect. Uh, that, is, uh, that is for sure. Um, so I, I'm not sure whether uh, we can expect too much from national governments, right? So because they, they still tend to be quite dominated by, uh, by economists working at the Ministry of Finance, right? That are totally a bit uh, in favor of neoliberal uh, approaches, things like that. I'm not so sure whether they, uh, also the pandemic will, uh, will, um, uh, 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 will change the attitude. Uh, uh, in, in that respect, um, I think uh, I, I'm a true European, right? And I think the European uh, is really doing a very poor job, as we all know, in dealing with this uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, virus. Um, and, and in my own country, uh, the Netherlands, of course, uh, not doing a really good job in that respect, no, no, not showing any solidarity. Uh, uh, in Europe, uh, so this is this is a, this is a major issue, probably which is even more pressing in Italy itself, right? Uh, because you were so hit hard by the uh, by the pandemic, and uh, and uh, yeah, uh, there was not much solidarity among, uh, especially uh, countries from northern Europe, uh, to help you out, uh, things like that, which will have repercussions for sure in the in the next coming months or the next coming years, uh, absolutely. Uh, but I still hope, and I, and I think that is what I still like very much about smart specialization policy, is a truly a European program, which I, which I said in my introduction. It's massive policy intervention, right? Uh, 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 I think many, I, I just presented, uh, well, a few months ago, I made a presentation at the planning agency in, in the Netherlands. Um, who do not like industrial policy uh, 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 themselves that much. But they, uh, uh, you could already see that there are also uh, uh, opinions are changing in that respect. So, uh, so I'm, I'm pretty optimistic uh, here. Um, so, yeah, uh, I think Europe uh, should step in. Uh, I'm not so sure uh, whether uh, we can rely on national countries, uh, but uh, apparently also. Uh, the attitude towards in you know, active industrial policy might differ from country to country within Europe. But okay. Right. Thank you, Ron. Uh, so just to alternate internal with external interventions, I got a question from the YouTube uh, stream channel by by Francesco Lally, who said, "Thanks a lot for this great opportunity. I have a question." Does this is this is interesting to me? Does as we consider the expectation and perceptions of actors involved? This has to do with the micro foundation of S3. Quite challenging question. <laughs> uh, um, 
yes, there have been some studies, right? So, okay, the ones that I presented, of course, do not take a micro perspective. Uh, it's uh, uh, all the analysis are done at the regional scale, right? So, uh, but of course, uh, you can go back uh, and go to the to the firm or even the individual, and uh, and and detailed. Uh, we have done some studies on that uh, because the whole uh, diversification framework uh, you can also apply uh, to the firm or the plant level. Uh, and indeed, we did some uh, uh, um, uh, some analysis there, uh, in which indeed uh, expectations and perceptions are, uh, are 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 included in a way. Uh, uh, the way they are included is because uh, um, um, uh, firms, uh, when deciding about diversification, uh, they uh, um, uh, uh, they're restricted by the type of capabilities that they have uh, acquired in the past. Uh, um, and um, so that will influence their perceptions of what is feasible and what is not feasible. And it, uh, and it, uh, and it might affect their expectations uh, 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 in the same manner, in the sense whether they, uh, they want to rate uh, the, the degree of success they might expect. Uh, from showing a certain type of behavior, in this case, moving into uh, in, into a, a new activity that uh, was not yet present uh, at the at the firm level. Uh, so I think the relatedness framework could really help a lot. And in fact, there are already companies uh, that have approached us in order to do this type of analysis uh, because uh, um, it's 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 not. Okay, if you want to, uh, if you are in, if you are a biotech firm, you know everything about biotech, right? Uh, it would be absurd to, uh, that I would tell them what what is biotech and where 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 the where the opportunities are. But what those companies tend not to know is what other technologies that might be complementary can can mean something to them, and 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 uh, and not only that because that is even a more general question, but also. Yeah, where where that type of capabilities are concentrated in Europe, right? So, so I have to think about investment strategies uh, and to how to allocate resources uh, across different European regions. Uh, they might have to take this into consideration, and they have not thought about this in the, in those terms that I present. So so if I talk to them, they they re uh, uh, um, yeah, uh, become enthusiastic about this and say, okay, this this is this is not the way how we looked at it from a relatedness perspective. We only know, of course, all our competitors and where the, the the most relevant competences are in Europe regarding our own technologies. But the technologies around that that could mean something to them and are complementary to what they know that might still be relevant for the success of their company. They do not take that into consideration. They just they, it's just not in their mindset, uh, and so uh, in that sense, indeed, it has uh, consequences for the type of expectations and perceptions actors uh, uh, might have in that respect. Yeah, yeah, very interesting indeed. There's another couple of questions from the YouTube, uh, but just again to alternate. I'm, I'm going to return back to YouTube in a while and leave the word to Masood, uh, who had a question for you. Masood, are you there? Still there? Yes, uh, Sandro, I'm here. Uh, so, hello. Masood is, is, is production student at, at the GSSI. This is an internal stuff. Please, Masood. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ron, for your nice presentation and giving us a lecture on your holiday because in the Netherlands it's holiday today. So, it is. <laughs> Uh, I really love, I really liked your presentation and your lecture, but I have a question regarding the social capital, the, the, the survey you have mentioned. Is it a direct measure of social capital, like bonding and bridging, or it's an indirect measure? And it, how it is related to the openness of a region toward, you know, uh, multiculturalism, toward the, uh, diversification, and so on. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a very good question, and indeed, uh, we we celebrate our Liberation Day today. Uh, so uh, that's uh, um, yes, um, yeah. About your question uh, about openness, I think uh, the bridging social capital really captures that, right? So uh, uh, it's more a kind of society uh, in which uh, it's more about inclusiveness, about openness, about uh, 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 not just connecting. Uh, 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 
to the ones that are like you, uh, uh, because we all have a tendency to do so, uh, and, uh, and in many societies that is the case, but that's more uh, the bonding uh, uh, social capital type. But the bridging shows capital type is really about making crossovers uh, between uh, uh, between groups in society, right? Um, and this is, of course, uh, coming under pressure more and more, as we can see that in many countries, and I, I don't think any country is an exception to that, uh, societies become much more polarized, right? Uh, we tend to uh, have uh, uh, less of interaction between groups uh, in society and, 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 and polarization. Also at the political level is just an expression of that. Uh, there's also a less willingness to collaborate, right? To form governments. Uh, uh, so I think it's, uh, it's part of a, a, a wider tendency in societies uh, in that respect. It has all to do with openness about uh, bridging social capital to what extent uh, people in societies, in regions, in countries are willing to collaborate, want to uh, be inclusive, want to connect to other groups uh, that normally do not interact too much uh, and to what extent there are many of these kind of bridging organizations also present that can make those connections and indeed uh, make it a more inclusive society instead of having many exclusive groups in society that do interact within each group but do not interact among groups that much. So I think that has very much to do with the openness concept that you talked about. Right. Uh, uh, Run, uh, do you still have some time? Because we agree that you stay there until noon. Now it's five past noon. Do you still have time for 10 minutes that we can go through all the questions that we have? Can we go? Yeah, on? yeah, that's fine for me. I'm not starving yet. So. <laughs> okay. So, uh, again, from our YouTube streaming, there's a uh, couple of questions from Mohamed uh, Aburesan, if I pronounce it well. Uh, which uh, is related to something that you already addressed. So well, I said thanks for a fantastic presentation. Uh, the question is whether S3 policy uh, can work, if I understand well, in any type of regions or in any type of industry, or whether there are limitations in the application of S3 to some regional slash industry domain. I think this this is the question. Right. That's a very important question, right? So I think it's a, it's a crucial one. I think it comes about, uh, big back to the question uh, about uh, uh, the person from Indonesia who was uh, talking about less developed regions. I think also many people that are writing about smart specialization, uh, like, uh, like Phil McCann and others, uh, they have also stressed the fact that uh, maybe smart specialization policy is, uh, is more a policy for the more advanced countries, right? That have already strong capabilities and that have much more opportunities in order to be successful in smart specialization policy. Well, the, 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 the challenge, of course, is uh, to also apply this to the less developed regions, the more peripheral regions, uh, because uh, there you really have to, th to think about a very different smart specialization policy, right? So as I, as I as I outlined a bit, uh, the, 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 the stark differences between Ile-de-France region and Extremadura region, right? Uh, as you remember, uh, the, the Ile-de-France region, you have this positive relationship between relatedness, density and complexity, meaning that Ile-de-France can really diversify in very complex activities uh, and add more complex activities to its economy because it is also very much related in that respect. So it can really uh, already has very relevant capabilities to move into more complex activities. Well, in peripheral regions, less developed regions, that, that relationship does not really exist. And old industrial regions, as I said, there was even a negative uh, relationship between the two. So, 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 so it's indeed very relevant to, to look at different type of regions and what type of implications that might have for the design and implementation of smart specialization policy. But this is, I think, the basic philosophy of smart specialization policy. It should be region specific. It should be bottom up. It should not be top down, right? Like, uh, and just treat any region uh, as any other region. Uh, this is, I think, what I really like about smart specialization policy, that you have indeed different opportunities in different regions, but also different challenges. And some regions uh, might have uh, less opportunities, which makes it more challenging 
to have an effective uh, smart specialization policy. So I think that we should devote all attention now on how to get it right for the more peripheral reasons, right? Where the, the, the structural problems are more prominent, are more enduring uh, and more lasting. And how can we break that uh, uh, with policy? Not easy. And uh, that's, uh, uh, I think, smart specialization policy would fail and not meet its objective if it would not have a, a strong response to that. All right. Uh, next, uh, I got other three questions that I think that we, we, should, we should conclude, not, not really to abuse of your time. Uh, it's a shame that Fabiano had to, to, had to leave, I'm afraid. He just wrote me. But he says, thank you very much. I don't know whether Fabiano is still there or just on your way. Uh, uh, you yes, Pedro, I, I'm, I'm here. Uh, yes, I have another call at 12, but it's okay. Um, thank you very much, Ron, for uh, your presentation. Uh, I just, just a simple question. I'd like to know if you consider uh, the potential existence of a correlation between uh, the, the smart uh, strategy and the different kind of uh, regional knowledge base. Uh, a la shame, we can say, be it uh, analytical, synthetical, or symbolic. Right. Yeah, no, of course. Uh, I mean, uh, what you could say is that uh, um, uh, you could uh, use those uh, three knowledge bases, right? Uh, analytical, synthetic, and symbolic knowledge bases in order to differentiate between different capabilities in regions, right? But yeah. I think the... the um, 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 but that this is only three categories, right? So, uh, uh, so uh, what I think our data allow is to go a bit more into detail, uh, to make uh, to make combinations between any capabilities, uh, no matter whether they are part of analytical or synthetic or symbolic knowledge space, uh, but just see which one need to be combined in order to move into a new technology or into a new industry or into a new occupation. Um, and then uh, I think the knowledge base uh, literature is also aware of that in the sense that uh, uh, what I uh, also proposed at some point of time is to, uh, to look more at the varieties within uh, each knowledge base and how to make combinations between different knowledge bases because it's not the case that if you only are specialized in analytical knowledge uh, that, you, uh, that, um, um, that you can thrive. Um, like, for example, uh, um, the, the, the self-driving car, right? So uh, uh, what is indeed uh, important in that type of technology or indeed in that kind of product or industry uh, is to make a combination between the three knowledge bases, right? So uh, it's analytical, of course, because there's a lot of scientific knowledge uh, attached to it, uh, satellite, sensor technology, artificial intelligence, things like that. But also synthetic knowledge, right? So you have to, you, you also have to know how to make a car, uh, and uh, and uh, that is covered by by, by uh, engineering uh, capabilities. And then there's also symbolic knowledge needed because, uh, uh, as you know, the uh, uh, cars only sell when they look nice. So you also have to look at the design, uh, which is more attached to symbolic knowledge. So so again, you have to make uh, the combinations of those. Uh, but then within those combinations, you can go, you should go much more into detail uh, um, and, and, and look at the variety within each of those knowledge bases. What type of combinations uh, uh, need to be made there? Good. Uh, we have another question from Alessandra De Renzi, who is a PhD student uh, of, of us, uh, like, like Andrea. So, Alessandra, are you there? Alessandra are you there? Yes, again? I'm here. Yes, I'm here. Um, hello. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Professor Boschma, for your brilliant presentation. As usual, very inspiring. Um, I'm also, as well as a PhD student, I'm also a regional officer. I work for smart specialization in Toscana. Okay. My question was related, first of all, to the uh, the year what, uh, about your data, first of all, and because what I was wondering is whether you have thought about considering a sort of path dependence um, implication in your data, and especially if you think that controlling for new relationship 
created after some instrument like Horizon 2020 or the S3 platform could be useful in your analysis? Thank you. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot uh, for that, Alison. Uh, uh, past dependency behavior, yes. Uh, okay, I, I'm not so much in favor of the word path uh, <laughs> because uh, I think it's uh, a very ill-defined. Uh, so uh, I, th I, I, I prefer to talk about past dependence, right? To what extent do you build on capabilities that you have developed in the past because they might provide opportunities, but they set also limits. To what you can be, the, what you can achieve in this diversification process, and that that is was what my whole talk was about, right? So just to give you an example, why uh, I, I I don't uh, um, I'm a bit critical to this path uh, uh, notion is uh, I did just did a paper on green diversification, and what you can actually see if you if you would say okay uh, uh, green uh, um, uh, uh, greening your economy is a new path in, in, with respect to the old, in which uh, our economy was heavily depending on fuel, uh, fossil fuels and uh, things like that. You could say, well, that is a different path, right? So you would move into a, a path of green. Uh, but what, what our analysis shows is that you also rely very much on the capabilities uh, of uh, this old path. Right, so it's not there is so so there is there is an interplay between the two. So I, I prefer to talk about path dependence and not about uh, path dependence, uh, but that's a quite uh, uh, crucial distinction. I think you're absolutely right. I think it's a very interesting question what you raised that whether new support instruments can really mean a difference uh, in terms of uh, the, as you refer to as uh, rise in 2020 projects. Now, what we observe, if we look at Horizon 2020 projects, they're very much related <laughs> to, uh, to what regions have already been doing before. So if the, uh, the, the type of themes, the type of capabilities that are in Horizon 2020 projects are almost a kind of reflection of the, the existing capabilities at the regional scale. So the Horizon 2020 projects tend to, uh, um, 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 uh, tend to rely very much on what is already there, and uh, and they're not uh, um, uh, resulting in so much uh, uh, novelty in the region itself, which is of course very understandable, uh, because uh, you 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 collaborate uh, with existing partners. Uh, many of the Horizon 2020 partners also uh, uh, projects also consist of partners that worked uh, previously. Uh, uh, before, so there's also there a past dependency, as you, if you if you like, uh, in that respect. So indeed, Horizon 2020 projects could be used to to move into new directions in regions by uh, by carefully selecting those projects that really make a region move into a new direction. And I would be very much. I think uh, uh, when we now select. Uh, uh, projects at the European scale, we do not take that into account that much. So, uh, so I think for me, for me, that would be the, one of the most crucial variables to say whether you which projects to to support and which projects not. Do they really implement novelty into the region? And this, I think, uh, and this is a policy instrument, right? So you can have an impact here because uh, this is financed. Uh, 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 by the European uh, um, uh, 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 Commission, so that's uh, so so you so you can make a difference in that respect uh, in terms of policy, uh, but then you have to have an idea about uh, uh, what you should support and what you should not support in, for example, this Horizon 2020 projects. Right. I hope I answered your question. Right, Ron. So we are nearly done. Uh, I, I tell to everybody that I stop taking questions. So we are done. Uh, and I will conclude with just two. Uh, Davide Piacentino uh, from the YouTube. Uh, 
uh, so he's not here with us, but he says, thank you for this opportunity. Interesting question is that, is there a significant effect of, of S3 on neighboring regions? So it, it, are there spillovering effects of these S3? Can we see a sort of spatial cutoff in this effect, Davide asks? Well, okay, first of all, um, I don't think we ever did an assessment of smart specialization policy, right? Because it is also too early to say, right? So to me, they should develop, uh, they should uh, have the objective to develop new economic activities. That part, that is a long-term process, right? So uh, you, you, uh, the, the program has only been, uh, has only started in 2014 and in most countries it was only implemented in 2015 or 2016. So it's too early to say. But yes, of course, you would also expect spillover effects from from uh, from to neighboring regions. Uh, we did some studies on that uh, in this diversification literature, saying, okay, uh, up to what extent indeed can uh, uh, um, okay, if you want to estimate the probability of a region to diversify into a new e economic activity. Is that depending on the capabilities that are present in the region itself? And is that depending on the capabilities in neighboring regions, right? So that's, that would mean a spillover effect. And indeed, uh, we have one paper in, uh, published in the papers in regional science that actually show that. But this is not, uh, this is not uh, uh, estimating the effect of smart specialization policy on neighboring regions, but it's more about uh, that the capabilities that are present in neighboring regions. Could they be helpful for you? to move into a new economic activity and we find a positive effect. Good. Right, very, very last. So there's a question from Maruska. Maruska, are you still there? You want to raise your question yourself or you want me to do it? Maruska, are you there? Or have you left the, the meeting? She's not there, I'm afraid. So I'm going to pose the question on a uh she says thank you for your great presentation it's just a question about the fact of technological classification can we suppose that extending the set of kin technologies will change the interregional linkages can the results be sensitive to classification and the analysis considers seven technologies right interesting with with the knowledge spec the way in which we build up the knowledge space and we retain as a structural features of, of the analysis. What do you think, Ron? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, okay. Um, well, when I was presenting the seven key technologies, uh, it's more about that the European Commission wanted to know about uh, what are the chances of European regions to excel in those seven key technologies because everybody's talking about that, right? So. Uh, and what then what we do is we look for, uh, I think, almost 1,000 technologies to what extent they are related to those seven key technologies. So, um, uh, so it's quite detailed information. Of course, you work with established uh, techn technological categories provided by patent offices, right? So, uh, uh, so they always be behind uh, technological chains, uh, things like that. We know that. Uh, but, uh, but because of the detailed, in fact, we are now doing a, pro, a few projects for, for Dutch regions and we apply this framework uh, because they're working now on their new specialization strategies. And there we can, uh, we, we even use tax mining analysis to, uh, to, to, uh, to develop related as indicators. And then we can, uh, we can distinguish between two, 250,000 technologies. So you can imagine, right? So then it's not, yeah, you don't care about predefined categories, right? Because the, the algorithm will decide which, which of those technologies are really meaningful, uh, can be meaningfully combined and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and have similar requirements. So in that respect, I think uh, we do a pretty thorough job. But you can only do that, of course, with, uh, with patent data and with technologies, industry data and occupational data. It's, it's a different story. Right, right. And I think that with this last question, uh, we can say that we we are done. I mean, that we'll declare the web seminar concluded. Uh, I would again thanks a lot, Ron, for having participated to this webinar, which I think, I mean, it worked at the end. 
we had an average uh, in between 50 and, seven, and 60 people connected on average along these two hours. So very successful. And I think that um, also the debate that we were able to have at the end was really uh, very stimulating. A lot of ideas came out. So for uh, internal staff, and let me remind you that uh, Ron is formerly part of the committee of our PhD, so you're going to have the chance to meet him again, hopefully in person. Let us hope that uh, the COVID-19 situation gets solved soon so that we can host Ron in L'Aquila and you can have a sort of a direct interaction with him, okay? So, um then uh, what i have to say again is that the series uh, will continue uh we are gonna have uh, the next uh, webinar uh on uh, thursday may the 7th so let me share with you the uh the slide with the details of the next webinar so uh, the webinar will be offered by Andrea Membretti from Iraq Research Bolzano, who's going to talk about COVID-19 crisis, quality, <laughs> mobility, proximity, and the role of rural and mountain areas after the COVID-19 crisis. So you are all more than welcome to come to this and, and the other and the other uh, uh, webinars. For the internal staff, there's no need for you to I ask uh, for permission to enter while the other external staff should write an email to the email address uh, socialwebinarseries.gssi.it ask margarita about the link and margarita will provide you with with the link okay so uh, this is everything from my side run uh, thanks a lot yeah, well, thank you, and uh, was uh, I, I really enjoyed it, and uh, I think uh, it was a fantastic discussion uh, after the presentation. So I'm really pleased. Uh, so I learned a lot from that. All right. And, uh, of course, uh, sharpens your thoughts, right? So uh, that's that's what it's all about. A terrific instance of mutual learning, I think. Thank you. Yeah, very absolutely. Thank you, thank you yeah. very much, guys. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, and I hope thank to see you, you soon. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Thank you, Ron. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Grazie, Andrea. <laughs> Prego. <laughs>